Jatayu is a writer, author, and a scholar. His areas of interest are Hinduism, culture, and current affairs. He's here with us today. Hi. And hello, Namaste. Um, you said you're based out of Bangalore, yes. so I'd like to ask you first: Is this your first visit to Pondicherry? Ah, uh, no. I have I have been visiting here. It's a wonderful place. Uh, I, I like. Uh, you know, it, it's a city with many interesting things, like the, the Aurobindo Ashram, the beautiful coastline. Perhaps one of the, perhaps the only city in India that has a beautiful promenade and a lot of cultural landmarks around the place. It, 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 it's a lovely place. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. Yes. Um, so we'll get down to the first question. Uh, which is today we are a very modern country and our children are very modern, but we come from a very ancient civilization which we are aware of to an extent. So, um, what are your what are your thoughts about this and how do we keep it relevant for us today? Yeah, right. You know, so so people ask how to put new eyes on Indian uh, ancient Indian culture and civilization. We really uh, it's not really a new eye. Right? So our vision has become myopic due to the colonial narratives uh, that have been quite active in our environment. You know? the, the, the racist narrative created by the colonial historians during the British period, the Marxist narrative after that, the pseudo-secularist narrative. So uh, it, this has caused some kind of a self-alienation among uh, the, the, the educated Indians who think that uh, the Indian culture is something very old and obsolete and ancient. And then there is you know, this modernity, uh, the, the modern development and the economic progress. Uh, so uh, there, is some, uh, there is some view that the Indian culture is essentially a past culture. I mean, there can be nothing more wrong than this. It's not, it's not a past culture or a culture that belongs to archaeology or the museums. You know, it's a very living and vibrant culture. So in this very own Pondi Lit Fest, so the last evening we had uh, a glorious Vedic chants performed by the students. And we have the classical Bharatanatyam performance or the Carnatic music. It's a, it's a very living, vibrant culture. So if it's not relevant for modern times, why do we even indulge in it, right? So we, we not only indulge in it, uh, this, this, is like, this is like a vehicle for, to showcase India all over the world. So having, having said that, you know, whatever people think as something modern or even postmodern is something so, so compatible with the, the values and the idioms of the Indian culture. So, you know, let me give a, a very quick example. So the first thing, uh, uh, the modern scientific outlook, right? So whether you take evolution or you take uh, the quantum physics. So all these concepts, they, they have so much conflict with the Abrahamic religions like Christianity and Islam. And it, it, it's a major uh, uh, ideological war going on, even in countries like the US, right? one of the very developed countries. But you don't even see a trace of that in India. Why? So there has never been any opposition to evolution from the practicing Hindus in India with such a huge Hindu population. Why? Because the, the, the concepts like, you know, we, we are talking out of Pondicherry, the land of Sri Aurobindo. So who, sp who spoke uh, so profoundly about the evolution, not just in the biological uh, perspective, but also in the spiritual perspective? And second, uh, we have this quest for knowledge free from dogma, the, the, whole, the whole ideas of our darshanas, like, like the Vedanta uh, or the Advaita, is about quest for absolute reality free from dogma, which is uh, even beyond modernity, you know, so to speak. And the, the diversity, right? So it's not, the, the, the India as a country is so much endowed with biodiversity. 
and we also have theo diversity and we have ethnic diversity and we are happily living here in, in spite of some small problems. So this is a, a, a very lofty concept, a very modern concept, the, the egalitarianism, uh, the liberty and stuff like that. And uh, the, uh, the balanced and holistic outlook in our culture, right? The values, uh, the, the values of life, the dharma, artha, kama and moksha. So it is not just uh, you know, stratified towards one goal of human life, ignoring all others. So these are uh, very, very enlightening concepts that the modernity is also coming towards these values. And these are enshrined in our Indian culture. Um, so I'll ask you the second thing, which is also related to culture. Given that we have such a unique diversity of cultures, what do you think is the essence or the swabhava of this country? Right. So, uh, you know, uh, the swabhava of uh, India is, uh, is in its uh, eternal and timeless spiritual ethos. So, in his recent uh, Independence Day speech, our Prime Minister uh, Modi, he quoted uh, the lines of Subramanya Bharati, is, which goes like, Ellorum Amaranilai Yaidum Nilayai. Ellorum Amaranilai Yaidum Murayai. India Ulagir Kalikum. So these lines he quoted verbatim, actually. So India will show the way to the world on how everyone can become immortal and divine. So this is really the Swabhava of, Swabhava of India which has been upheld by our rishis, savants, and yogis, uh, all our art traditions and culture traditions. I think this is, this is the quintessential message of Indian culture. That's interesting. Um, so I will then go to the next question, which is you again related to the diversities that come in. Now, given that we are so diverse, even within a, one particular community, let's say just the Hindus, what is the way in which we, you think we could unite it? And uh, is, is there a way in which we could unite it? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Hindu society, uh, as we know, is very diverse, right? So we are divided uh, on the caste lines, which is traditionally called jati. And then we are divided on sect, there are Shaivas, Vaishnavas, Shakti worshippers, so many diverse traditions. And uh, th there is always, of course, the, the digital divide, you know, the so-called rural-urban divide. And then there are uh, so-called tribal people. So, so we, uh, our tradition calls them Vanavasis, right? We don't call them tribals. So, th so it's a mind-boggling diversity. So how do we unite them? So there is a lot of talk about diversity, which is very good. But unfortunately, you know, there are also attempts at creating fault lines and uh, creating a wedge among people using these, uh, using these differences. There is, it is one thing to celebrate diversity while being aware of the innate unity. And there is another thing to just exploit, you know, with such a society, you, you can keep dividing it, uh, dividing people horizontally and vertically and cross-sectionally in so many ways, which unfortunately the political class of India is exploiting, right? Uh, so how do we unite people? I think we have to keep reminding people of all the, 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 the unity. So there is Ramayana, there is Mahabharata, there are traditions. Uh, uh, th there are like time immemorial uh, practices like pilgrimage. The, the people from the, the Rameshwaram going to the Kashi and the people from up north doing the Chardham Yatra. So we have to strengthen all these cultural practices which have been coming. But you know, that alone is not sufficient. I think, uh, so there are some real issues like uh, the, the, is the, the, the issue regarding the SCST people. So th that there is real discrimination against people. 
So there are issues of Vanavasi's people we need to address. So it's very important for the government and the larger society to be sensitive and empathetic to the real issues. But then there are also artificial issues. Uh, so for example, the, 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 uh, in Tamil Nadu, there is the Aryan Dravidian racist uh, thing. There is nothing real about it. I mean, it's a artificially, uh, it's a colonial construct which is being used to divide people to, to just create uh, you know, animosity and conflicts. So, so why, while we are empathetic to the, to the real issues, solve them, address them, we should also be ruthless in rejecting and exposing these artificial issues that divide people. When we do both this, I think we can unite Hindus, Hindu society. You mentioned that the Hindu society itself had mind-boggling diversity. Now in India, now you add to this mix the Muslims and the Christians also. So now how do we invite, how do you unite everybody that... Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, uh, so the Christians and Muslims of India are just yet another religious community in this huge landscape. It's not that, uh, again, if you go very deep into the social history, uh, of these communities. They, all, uh, they, they are all the sons and daughters of this soil. It's not, of course, though they practice the, the religions that sprang up in alien lands, they are still the children of uh, this country and they have been living side by side of the Hindu communities. And we, we have to uh, really, you know, make use of this uh, interconnectedness. And we have just because the Christians and Muslims follow different religions, that doesn't mean they are not like foreigners or, or alien people, right? And we have glorious examples like uh, uh, Ustad Bismillah Khan, right? Who, who used to live by the side of the Ganga and sing at Vishwanath temple every day. And we have Dr. Uh, we had Dr. Uh, Abdul Kalam here, who grew up in Rameshwaram, who, who, who almost lived a life steeped in Hindu culture, uh, the culture of this land. And coming to Christians, uh, you know, we had people like Varghese Kurian, uh, who, who founded uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an enterprise like Amul. Uh, and we had this J.C. Kumarappa, right? The Gandhian. Uh, uh, so so wh who were very much rooted in the culture and the traditions of India, though they were practicing the, 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 the Christianity and the Islam. And what we need to be to, to make aware, uh, you know, to, the, to the, uh, the Christians and the Muslims of our country is that the, the politicized narrative of their own religion should not be allowed to overpower what is called Indian nationalism. They can practice religions in their personal space and even uh, in, the, in the community space, in churches and mosques. But it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't assume a, a highly political and aggressive dimension that is directly in conflict with the ideas of Indian nationalism and the overall well-being and welfare of all Indians. I think this, we, we need to stress this point. And that's what is very important to unite all of us as Indians. If you had unlimited power, is there anything that you would do specifically to help this unity? Uh, yeah, you mean to say, I mean, unlimited power in the Indian context is like becoming a prime minister with absolute majority, uh, right? That's what I, I presume that that's what you mean. Uh, see, there are so many things you can speak about, but uh, since we have a very short time, I'll just address two, two issues, right? The first is the, the Article 13, which uh, is creating an educational apartheid in the whole country. Uh, it, it was created with the very benevolent and noble uh, idea of empowering minorities, not just religious minorities, but the linguistic and ethnic minorities as well. But unfortunately, over the decades, it has become so perverted that it has 
created an educational apartheid in the country, uh, completely benefiting the, 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 the Christian and Muslim educational institutions and cultural institutions at the national level and depriving uh, the Hindus in a very institutional way. So I would repeal this article in the sense that it won't deprive anyone, it will just remove the discrimination meted out against the Hindus. So now Hindus can also run their educational and cultural institutions just like the way the Christians and Muslims are doing it all over India. And the second thing I would do is on the reservation front. I think now we have such a sophisticated technology, uh, the data sciences have uh, become uh, so sophisticated that we can actually create, uh, get the realistic data of who all are deprived uh, in, uh, in, inside the country at a family basis and a community basis and a village basis and just channel the reservation benefits and affirmative action towards these people, you know. There is no caste based reservation, no sub caste based, there are no uh, various hierarchies and levels of caste based reservations. Do away with all this, just use technology to find out who is deprived and just address the benefit towards them. That would be fantastic. One last question. Um, since we are at a lit fest, are you reading any book and what books would you recommend for the others to read now? Ah. So that's uh, actually uh, uh, at any point of time uh, I have been, I keep reading so many books. But you know, one book uh, which I would recommend in the sidelines of this lit fest is uh, The India's Rebirth by Sri Aurobindo. So it's not really a new book. So there was a old edition of this book brought out by Voice of India, right? It was out of print uh, for a long time. Now, Michel Janino. Uh, he has, uh, he, I think with a, with a detailed f uh, foreword and introduction. So this book has been republished by Rupa uh, very recently. You know, th th this book, it's so inspiring that anyone who is interested in the regeneration and the overall uh, renaissance of India uh, in the political, social, economical, cultural, spiritual, spheres. This book is a must read for every one of them. The, 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 you know, the, this book is nothing but a collection of Sri Aurobindo's thoughts right? over a few decades, a very crucial period in India's freedom struggle. But they are so relevant and so, uh, the, the, so inspiring, and so thought provoking that they are very relevant even today. I, I, I'm just reminded of one quote. So he says, uh, you know, the youth of a nation who are always imbued with the glory of the past and the pains of the present and the dreams for the future, that country always moves on the path of progress. So this is one of the profound quotes of uh, Sri Aurobindo from that book. And I recommend that uh, it's a must read for everyone. And anything for children? Uh, children. I think uh, the, 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 the children, uh, the more they are exposed to many facets of our Indian culture and tradition, you know, it really develops their personality in a very big way. I think the, the parents think that children are overstressed academically, so they simply don't want them to indulge in other activities, like, uh, let us say, uh, 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 learning uh, classical music or, uh, you know, uh, attending, let us say, a bhajan program or even attending family occasions like a wedding, a, a, a wedding ceremony or other, uh, you know, other occasions where the families come together. This is a very wrong idea. I think pe people in many urban Indian cities, they always want to uh, 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 goad their children into a very ambitious and pressurized environment. I think children should be exposed to as much of these, uh, uh, the aspects of our culture. It will eventually develop in the, in the, uh, the blooming of their overall personality. That's what I think. Well, thank you very much, Ji. Thanks for the time.